Ladies and gentlemen, I am your host, the Sick Runner. But before I start talking about that, I want to explain, because I know a lot of people have been wondering, you know, when the stream's coming back, uh, how's the break going? Let me rewind on the off chance you're not fully familiar of what's been happening. So the first thing is, ever since February or so, uh, I've been having regular fatigue attacks. Now, there's a lot of reasons that built up to that, but it boils down to the fact that I just, I needed to take a break, and I couldn't bring myself to do so. So, I kept working. The fatigue attacks got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, until finally, um, I don't know, a, a few weeks ago, I've, I've lost track of time at this point, I was like, all right, as much as I absolutely hate the idea, I am going to have to just take a honest-to-God break. Just not a dark. Because remember, for those of you not aware, whenever I take a dark, I get work done. In fact, I get a lot of work done. I work more than uh, I do when I'm streaming during darks. So those aren't breaks. So I was like, okay, I need to actually take a break. And it was it was going to be the first break I'd taken uh, since before I can remember. To be honest with you, um, I've never actually taken a break from streaming, so at the very least, it would have been the first break I ever took uh, on this job. So, ooh. What the heck is shaved today, too? Anyways, I look terrible, I'm sorry. So, yeah, not, not in a uniform. Everything's cool, right? So, I was going to take a break right after the FF14 run. However, uh, several people were looking forward to the Pokemon Arceus run and had it scheduled around that. So, in order to accommodate them, I was like, okay, we'll do, we'll do Arceus. And if you remember, I, the Arceus run was kind of intermittent. I had to pause a few times in the middle of the day because fatigue was just smashing me in the face. But I did it. I pushed through Arceus. Cool. We did it. I'm like, okay. Everything's cool. We finished Arceus on a Saturday. The previous Friday night, my brother-in-law gets a, gets a mandate from his job. It says, hey, we need you to come all the way up to Minneapolis Sunday morning. Now, this is what I like to call the domino, because this has affected the entirety of my life since this happened, and not just mine. Um, let me start by saying that if at least it was like for something, like if there was some big work benefit for him, you know, leaving to go cross country with a day and a half notice, you know, maybe, maybe. Maybe that would have been acceptable. Maybe it's the kind of thing I could have swallowed a little bit. Yeah, right? Like, it was important. No, no, it's it's a business thing. Uh, it's really common, actually, for a lot of business people to have to do business trips like that. But here's the thing. How many of you know what FaceTime is? The concept, not the, the phone thing. I can explain it. <laughs> it's really dumb. Pretty much, like, to, to summarize this whole story, it could have been an email. But I want you to understand this. I want you to understand just how stupid this is. So, um, I'm not getting to his job too much. He's a programmer. Yeah, he is one of the main project leads for most of their primary rollouts. So, once most of the majority of the coding has been done, it is usually handed over to him and his team in order to then actually implement, execute, and make sure to push it to production, right? So, the customer he was working with right now, the client, they were like, hey, your thing doesn't work. And he was like, yes, it does. And they're like, no, no, no. And he was like, no, you're wrong. And objectively could prove that they were wrong. 
and that the software was ready to roll out and was ready to roll out on time. But there's these two assholes at the client who I personally have a grudge against, despite having never met them, because they insisted that the whole thing was crap. You've probably, if you've ever worked in any kind of corporate environment, you probably know the type, the type who's just going to be antagonistic for basically no reason. Um, so they kept pushing back and saying, no, 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 it's not working. There's all these issues which weren't issues. Like my favorite example, I'll, I'll try to be vague about this, but like there was a specific thing where he, uh, if, if, if you did the conversion of the old uh, database to the new SQL database, um, it was like chakunk, and then it would throw up three errors on the side, which they've known about for weeks and already had another thing to grab and then readjust those three entries into the new SQL database without any issue. So they look as they say, there's hundreds of errors whenever we try to transfer the thing over. And these two assholes tell their bosses, this is just, this is, it's not ready. It's not complete. There's all these problems. We're not going to be ready until like June. And they just, they just pulled June out of their hat from absolutely nowhere. Now, obviously the company that brother-in-law works for is like, what are you doing? So they work out a compromise, which is, they, you know, they're, we're going to go ahead and we're going to hammer this out which could have been done over a Zoom call or an email. But then we get to the concept of FaceTime. Now, for those of you who don't understand, uh, there's this archaic dinosaur philosophy in corporate America that has been old for over a decade now, where they insist that you actually come into the office or, and talk to someone in person, even though there's absolutely no reason to do so. And in fact, it's actually detrimental to the work in question. It actually costs the company money in every way to get you into that office and doing that. Now, this is true even if you happen to live like, you know, 20 minutes that way. But in this case, they demanded that he fly all the way up to Minneapolis. Please think about how much additional charge this is, because obviously there's the flights, but that's a joke. Because then you have to pay the extra overtime for the on-site work for him and someone else, by the way, who flew in from the United Kingdom. Because this is an international company. By the way, the guy from the United Kingdom also had a day and a half notice to be able to fly to Minneapolis. So FaceTime, it's its a really dumb thing. It, it, I don't want to get into polemic topics. Here's the answer. I don't know exactly why FaceTime exists. But it absolutely exists. It is a common tendency for managers, especially, to insist on seeing someone in person, being physically present to someone, even if there's absolutely no reason to do so. That's that's FaceTime in a nutshell, right? And if you get FaceTime, it's usually considered a good thing. You're more memorable to the higher ups, and you're more likely to be picked for uh, promotion opportunities, bonus opportunities, etc. Right? That's FaceTime. So everyone puts up with it because they benefit from it even though it's stupid and a waste of everyone's time and money. Make sense? I have worked at one, one corporate job in my life that does not have FaceTime. That was nice. Anyways, day and a half warning, he goes up there. Now, you're probably thinking, what does that have to do with you, Lore? Well, with such short notice and such circumstances, my break was supposed to start probably like Monday or Tuesday. I did have some paperwork I wanted to get done before I started my break. I'll get to that in a second. Instead, uh, what happened is I spent the week watching my nieces. Now, exactly, please just know. That's, that is speculation on my part, but uh, yeah, exactly. Um, here's the deal. Under any other circumstances, getting to spend a week hanging out with my nieces and playing with them and watching over them is awesome. And if I'm being honest, I created a lot of really nice and really fond memories that last week that'll carry with me for a long time. But the thing is, if you're paying attention, I was already having so much fatigue, I couldn't even put a full work shift on the last game I was streaming, Pokemon Arceus. So I was already falling apart tired. Also, so was my sister, for unrelated reasons. So the two of us are dead tired on our feet, and suddenly having to watch several very young, very energetic children all, all week, completely by ourselves and with no assistance. Yeah, exactly. Dark Prince Revan. 
I was already well on empty. And it was just like... And uh, I love my nieces to death. But they take a lot of energy. So that was that week. That ended last Saturday. A few days ago now. Because he finally got back. Naturally, because he was up in Minneapolis, where it's cold, he had to fly a plane a couple of times, he got sick. Duh. I mean, I hate to say that, but duh, right? That's basically baked in. So then my niece got sick, and then my sister got sick, and then I got sick. Now, by this point, I was sick to death of not being done with all this paperwork crap. Let's explain the paperwork scene. So I just decided to push through it. And that's why it's taken me, what is it, five days now? It's like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I guess four and a half days. It's Wednesday, right? Yeah. Four and a half days to finish this. It probably should have only taken me like two. It wasn't that much paperwork. It just had to be done. But I had a week with my nieces and then I was sick. So I haven't even started taking my break yet. It's kind of the summary of this entire story. Now, several people asked, what the hell is this paperwork you were doing? Well, the paperwork I was doing was getting a sub from Vansini. Whoops. Thank you, Vansini. I will put that towards dealer's choice. Um, so I can explain very, very simply uh, what I've been doing. If you type exclamation mark audit into chat right now, you will see the primary project I have been working on. I've actually known this is something I had to do for almost a year now. Um, but the audit sheet being up to date and accurate is something that's really important. And it wasn't put very, very simply. So I wanted to do a nice big stretch of just just keep getting it up to code. It's it's the kind of boring ass thing that nobody cares about, um, which which I actually disagree with. I care a great deal of it. It's infrastructure, right? You know, we, we could talk to Baltimore about in infrastructure right now, and I'm not trying to make light of that. I'm just saying that's why infrastructure is important. So I needed to go through, and get this sheet up to code, because it very much wasn't. It was still using an outdated system, and several games hadn't actually been properly updated on it. Furthermore, some of the categories weren't actually... Yeah, exactly, does he work? Several categories weren't actually being tracked correctly. For example, pacing, padding, and seconds and minutes were all being considered in the same category, and I needed to split that up. And uh, brickwork and sprite work were being considered in the same category, and I had to split that up. So, that was the initial audit. Thing is, as I was going through uh, Blade Travol, mentioned something and I noticed that there was another flaw so that just added another thing to uh to to the audit list right because that's how it works right if, if picture you're on an, an assembly line as you're going to, down the assembly line you notice a flaw you can do two things or three things you can ignore it completely you can fix the flaw and move on or you can mentally flag that for something to check to make sure that flaw isn't happening anywhere else and that's what I did so I actually did six separate audits, um, each individual like, okay, hang on, this is this is screwed up, so let's see if there's any other issues with that. This is screwed up, so let's see if there's any issues with that. You get the idea. And that's the primary thing. A few scores have changed, but it's all really, really small changes, just to be slightly more accurate. But there's one, one big example, one big exception, and it's what I'm working on right now. Because uh, one of those things that I skipped over, and this is my fault, I'll admit it, was that there were several issues with the Starfield run. <laughs> and I'm honestly curious if with proper, uh, proper results and proper things, where Starfield will list. Because if you look at the review page right now, it is mostly up to date. It is up to date except for Starfield. The Starfield entry there is actually not up to date if you, if you just check the review sheet or the review page, excuse me. But I'm going, I've, I'm actually staring at the document right now and I'm double checking with my other document over there as I've been doing for the rest of these entries just to make sure. And lo and behold, I've already noticed a few issues. So yeah, Starfield just it just keeps on giving. It's really, it's really amusing to me. I was kind of hoping Mr. Red would be here. 
because I'm really curious if it is going to end up beating Kingsfield 4, because at the moment, Kingsfield 4 is in the number 5 slot. Uh, but that's it. That's that's the summary. Uh, I am going to actually, actually take a friggin' break soon. Um, for those of you who have asked this, hang on just a sec, sorry. Some people have asked how long of a break you're taking. Um, if I actually had a ETA on the break, then it wouldn't be a break. And I'm, I'm kind of tired and dead, brain dead right now, so I don't really have the best possible way to uh, explain that. But I wouldn't be able to relax properly if I had a set amount of time on the break in order to actually relax, in order to actually un unclench, for lack of a better word, mentally unclench, I need to not be freaking out about the fact that I have to start stream Saturday or whatever, something like that, right? So that's the primary reason. Yeah, the break will end when the break is over, when I am recovered. Obviously, being sick is throwing a bit of a wrench on that, so it might take a little bit longer than I would like. Oh, yeah. That's another thing. I came very close to just going back to streaming tomorrow, sick or no. Because I've been like a week and a half um, off, off of stream. I've lost a week and a half of my life to uh, to this whole stupid Minnesota trip and, um, and to being sick. So that sucks. <laughs> But several of my friends and family members made me promise that I would not do that. That I would not go straight back to streaming after uh, after I finished uh, the paperwork, which I'm doing this very second. I hazardous. No, no, I wasn't in Minnesota. My, my brother-in-law was in Minnesota. He's not there anymore. Otherwise, I wouldn't even be done with the paperwork yet. I am done with the paperwork. Well, I'm finishing with the paperwork right now. As we speak. We live further south than Minnesota. Didn't be vague about specifics. So he was rather fascinated with the concept of snow. Because you've been getting some snow the last week. True, everything's south of Minnesota. Fair enough. Did you end up getting that pizza, by the way? Oh, I remember Round Table. I miss Round Table. I don't know if it's still good. But Round Table used to be my favorite pizza place back up in Auburn, uh, which is north of Sacramento, for those of you who don't know. Which is in California, for those of you who don't know. Which is in the United States, for those of you who don't know. Oh, my name sucks, Seth. But thank you for asking. Where's the United States? That's, that's on Earth. Although some people pretend it isn't. Uh, $31 good. God, yeah. That's just stupid. 31 bucks for a pizza. You know the single individual thing that pissed me off the most about pizzas? Very off topic here. When they started calling large... Uh, it's when they started calling mediums large. You remember that? This is like... I don't know, I 
want to say like 12, 13 years ago at this point. Do you remember when they started, like every pizza place just started calling their mediums large. Well, if you want a large, you can get an extra large, but that, you know, obviously that's going to be more expensive because their extra larges were not large. And they just got rid of the extra large. Hated that. But I like cold pizza. Uh, well, I will hunt down and genocide, suicide, uh, fascist. Uh, what else we got, YouTube? Um, what else is a hot button thing for YouTube nowadays? Um, we, I don't like cold pizza. I don't like cold pizza. Um, I know a lot of people who do. I know a lot of people prefer cold pizza. That's insanity to me. If I can't reheat the pizza, it's not for me. Now, here's the thing. You can reheat a pizza that's stale and actually unstale it once. I'm sure several of you actually know this trick. You get like a paper towel and get it damp, right? Just get it a little bit wet and wrap it, uh, wrap it around the bread, wrap it around the, the crust. And then nuke it up that way and the, um, the humidity of it will, will reinvigorate the bread. But only do it once. The trick only works once. After that, it's gone. That's another one, Disco. That's a good one. I like that. Lord is the entrance to the warp. Makes so much sense. Makes so much sense. For the Trek lore run, which I have actually managed to do one episode of in a week and a half. We covered The Expanse, which is the season finale of season two, if you don't remember. Uh... We couldn't stop joking about it. No offense to anybody who actually lives in Florida, obviously, duh. But we couldn't stop joking about it, that that the aliens decided to do that to Florida, of all places, right? Hmm. I don't have a PS5. You're a Mormon. I'm 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 gonna have to wait till the PC anyways. Which is fine. First time I play it, I'll play it on camera. I've been playing a couple of things, or rather I've been wanting to play a couple of things. Let me, let me use my correct terminology here. Like that. Has anybody seen that freaking MOBA mode? Or wow. Uh I'm gonna go with a no, Sir Jorah moment, because I'm not aware of anything with that. Plunderstorm, that's what it's called. Plunderstorm. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say no, Ross, but that's only because I don't think I could have appreciated Con Connor Trenier any more than I already did, if that makes sense. So, let me give you an example. Um, during... Uh, don't tell me, Sergio. I'll get there. I'll get there. There's a... Uh, the first episode... Ooh, my throat's giving out on me. Give me a sec, sorry. The first episode of Enterprise... Um, sucks. And I never realized just how badly it sucked until I went through for the lore run. It's been... It's, it's, it's been so enlightening. I want to talk about that if you don't mind. But the episode sucks. Um, it's, it's like if you zoom in on any individual scene, every individual scene in a vacuum sucks. S pun not intended. The, there's this bit where, um, there's this bit where, uh, Connor Trenier, who's playing Tucker, has a line. And if you divorce yourself from the performance and listen to the line, it is this extraordinarily, like, scum levels of, of specious line, right? And Connor Trenier just couldn't quite do that. He was too affable, too friendly. Because because he, he's he's a great actor and he was he had a he had hit it off very well with most of the other actors immediately. So he says it in a way that it doesn't come across like that. But the line is still like that and the whole scene portrays it as if he's being a total dick to her. Which is funny, 
because then it actually is flipped a little bit. It makes her out to be the asshole because she's the one refusing his. Yeah, it kind of is Jesse Ward. It's the same thing, and it's 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 the whole thing just is slanted weird because Connor Trainer is just that awesome. Um, it's been so fascinating. <laughs> Excuse me. Ah, uh, oof. Okay. Uh, um. Thank you, Cumulization. Very, very much for the sub. If you give me a moment. Uh, here it is. Jolene Blaylock is still my second favorite Vulcan actor. Period. Like she, she really is fantastic. Now she doesn't get a chance to come into her own until um, season three. But that's true for all of them, right? Like, even my favorite episode uh, of season one, which was uh, Shuttle Pod 1, there's still some eh, bumps in the road there, right? Yeah, Tim Russ is number one, absolutely. Oh, absolutely, Jesse Ward. You should just kill them off. Because everyone tells me Scott Bakula is a good actor. I, I don't mean to say this as a negative I just haven't seen any evidence of that um, and I've been covering Trek for a long time because Trek has this thing where you can tell when an actor is really good and is just handed a bad role Kate Mulgrew in Janeway is a perfect example of that but Scott Bakula does not manage it as Archer at all he never manages it the whole show the first time he's anything uh, is later on, and even then, it's not like he's better, it's just more like the role's better, and he's still kind of eh, just, you know, it's just kind of doing his thing. It's it's less bad. We'll put it that way. It's less bad. Thank you, Tiny Shroom, very much for a full year of support. Thank you. And if you want to put that towards up to three things, please let me know. Thank you. Um... God, the fact that he brought his dog into the uh, uh, Delphic Expanse is just... Please think about that for a second. He has been warned over and over and over about how terrifyingly dangerous the Delphic Expanse is. And he brings his dog to the Delphic Expanse. Please think about that. But the thing I have found most interesting about the Trek lore run is that I've been... Obviously, it's a lore run for someone else. It's a very personal thing because I can't stream Star Trek episodes. Thanks, copyright law. Um, yeah, a region of space that turned crew inside out. That's a real thing. That's a real thing that happened. Um, but... Um, the... Uh, how do I put this into words? I didn't realize how much I missed during the Trek ruminations until I started the Trek lore run. Now, with hindsight, that probably sounds like a duh. Of course, I'm getting more detail in the lore run. It's a lore run. I can pause and say, look at this, right? I can make here, you know. But I think part of it from my perspective, and this is kind of a long way of saying thank you to you guys, guys, gals, and in-betweens, is that I prefer Sure Adventures. Give me a minute, though. Um, it's also true, Dark Prince Roman. Uh, I prefer reviewing. So I, I've got two analysis modes. I never actually realized this until recently, until I started the Trek Law Run. Um, I've got two analysis modes. And I apparently can't talk and type at the same time. One is more surface level, for lack of a better way to put it. And, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm sitting, if I'm watching something, maybe it's all, uh, if I'm watching something for rumination, I'm taking notes. I'm doing research, I'm compiling things, and I try to present it to you in a short, summarized format. But if I'm reviewing something, I go way more in depth and way more in detail. It's one of the reasons why my opinion on so many Trek episodes has changed as I've been going through it, is because I'm zooming in the camera more, for lack of a better way to put it. 
Um, and yeah, the ruminations were also very, very rushed. Not a lot of people remember that I would just sit here and just watch, research, record, watch, research, record for like the whole dark. Those were the first darks um, before, so I could get back to my, to my actual job. That was a thing. So, it's been fascinating because I've noticed stuff I've, no, I've never noticed before. Me. I've noticed stuff I've never noticed before. I've caught stuff I've never caught before. And my opinion has changed a few times. And what's funny, Ross can attest to this, usually my opinion doesn't really go up or down. It goes both or sideways. A perfect example. Uh, Remember Me, which is an episode that's really, really, really good until there's just this segue i'm not gonna spoil it but there's a segue for no goddamn reason other than the pad out to runtime and it completely ruins the entire episode um, if you eject it from existence the whole episode improves instantly and there's several examples of that yeah darmok is the exact same way you get rid of the a plot of darmok and that episode is fantastic and it's so easy to see why people like it thank you winlock very very much as always, um, if you know what up to three things you want to put the towards, please let me know. Um, going through the movies was fascinating. Check this out. Check this out. I wish I could show this to you. So how many of you know what Planet Soundstage is? I should probably just answer. Planet Soundstage uh, was the name for a specific uh, film studio. Film room. Yeah, film warehouse might be the better word in uh, the Paramount lots, and it usually had this really fake, um, like, plasticky looking terrain, and sorry, Jesse Ward, sorry, you can tell her sorry from me, uh, and it's usually used mockingly. Uh, I should mention that Planet Soundstage has been used well over the years, because it depends on what they add it, add to it, <coughs> but it's called that because it's, it's a soundstage, and it's usually used to do an alien planet. At its absolute worst. You know, maybe I can get away with this. Maybe I can get away with this. Hang on a second. Let me let me go down here. Okay, this is just me. This is what I don't want. What I want is something that I'm not seeing. Seriously? No, no, the A plot, not the main plot. The A sorry. The studio terminology, not mine. I disagree with this. The studio terminology is the A plot is whatever plot is that with that has the ship in trouble. So a lot of times the A plot is the crap plot, right? You know what I mean, right? Um, in Swarm and Voyager, or in Darmok, or in uh, I can think of any other examples right now. You know what I mean? You could probably think of several episodes where it's like, hey, the ship's in danger. Oh no. Data's day. You know what? Another good example. And that's, you know, that's your main... Okay, there we go. Perfect. Okay, so what we're going to do... It's okay. We're not showing any footage. Pen Pals. Another good one. Yeah, the B-plot... Again, their terminology, not mine... Is usually the actually interesting part of those episodes. Okay, so... Planet Soundstage, right? So let's pause that. I've frozen the Earth. I'm sorry for everyone I just flung off into deep space. But this is probably the worst. No, pause, pause, pause. There's Q. When did they first get down? There was that first shot. Look at that. Look at that. Look at it. This is Planet Soundstage. Now, this is probably the worst uh, shot of Planet Soundstage ever. <coughs> but you probably recognize it, right? You probably recognize it. And it's just... It looks so bad. And so cheap. Yeah, it looks like Starfield. It really does look like Starfield. That is so apt. Oh my god. But the reason I wanted to bring this up is not just to bash Planet Soundstage. Actually, because I actually saw a good usage of Planet Soundstage, which I have never noticed before. Believe it or not. Check this out. Check this out. This is so cool. So some, oh geez, that's a huge thing. Okay, there we go. So some of you are, of course, aware of the fact. Some of you are aware of the fact that uh, Wrath of Khan was a complete shoestring budget, right? And if you go through this movie, you know what I mean, right? Like Wrath of Khan is an extraordinarily cheap film. But 
Nicholas Meyer is so good at working with a budget. It's one of the reasons they convinced him to come back for uh, Star Trek VI. This right here is Planet Soundstage. This whole section, as they're going through this planet and they're exploring, like you can see it, right? If you're really looking, you could see it. And I did, I did some double checking and research. It is, it is actually Planet Soundstage. It's extremely cheap. They've got one fog light in the background. You can see it. That's supposed to be the sun, and they've got a sand filter over the front, and they actually managed to make Planet Soundstage look good. Wrath of Khan, so for years I've said Wrath of Khan is a better film than Undiscovered Country, but I prefer Undiscovered Country. I'm no, I no longer have that opinion. Um, Wrath of Khan is a damned good film. It's a very talented film, and I appreciate it a lot more. But uh, it's it's really fascinating, just, just the construction of it. And Undiscovered Country is, is just a, an amazing film. Um, top to bottom. I have nothing else to add to that. because here's the here's the thing here's the thing let me use another comparison okay i don't want to bash generations but you know what star trek 6 does so of course i cannot play this for you but this opening picture what's happening here <laughs> what's happening <laughs> it's just names on a star field right and then whatever that is the thing is this sequence is well designed I'm sure most of you could actually, I didn't know that there's this, could actually hear the music that plays through this sequence right now. And what's really cool about it is it tells a story. The music isn't just atmospheric, it actually is kind of telling the tale of the buildup to this moment, and it ends on a bang. Now that's cool. The reason I bring this up is because it's cheap. It's a really, really cheap... Remember, Star Trek VI did not have a particularly large budget. It had a decent budget. Thanks, Harv Bennett. We will always be grateful for that. But it still had a pretty small budget in some ways, so they had to be careful with it. So how do we make this cheap budget work? Now, you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with Generations? Well, do you remember Generations' as intro? No, I don't mean, like, the amazing part. I mean, this stupid thing. This is some generic wallpaper music that plays over a star field with a glass bottle flinging through space. Explain this to me. By all means, I'll wait. This means nothing. The, yeah, this is Starfield. This is Starfield. It's just a waste of time. It doesn't do anything. And then it ends with this stupid shot. And just... Oh. It's just, it's so bad. It's so bad. And it's a shame because this, this opening section is, is, is so damn good. Can I just say, when I was, because we went through Generations as well, obviously we did all the TNG films. This opening sequence is so goddamn good that what I just complained about is pretty much the only complaint I have about the entire sequence. There, there is one other complaint, and you know what it is if you know this sequence. This, oh my god, this is so good. I, I wish I could just play this for you and, and play it beat by beat because here's the other thing i like to point out numbers i really like to go into specifics and details because it's me this is 18 minutes of joy right here in a two-hour movie about an hour and a half movie really and that's awesome this these 18 minutes is just perfection with again so few errors that i would consider them irrelevant by the way thank you very very much spartan always appreciate and deck 15 yep deck 15 Homeworld block, dead space, R. And dealer's choice, you got it. But this, this is what I wanted to talk about. This is what the lore run has been. Going through... Saw that, Spartan. Going through, piece by piece, really zooming in and really talking about what they did right, what they did wrong, and why. That's why I call it a lore run. It wasn't supposed to be a low run originally. It just kind of naturally have developed into one. Um, and, you know, can I just say that nothing has made me hate this sequence more 
Hang on. Yeah, this 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 sequence up here. Then going through it with a fine tooth comb. This whole sequence right here. Just. I've always I've known this is bad since I saw this in the theaters. This this sequence. I knew it was bad when I did my rumination on it. But it's crazy how much worse it gets when you're really zooming the camera in on the second to second moments and exactly what's happening in this sequence. This is so bad. Yeah, frame by frame. So it, it, I've talked about this before. I've always said that my analyses are much more uh, surface level because you, you can really, really zoom the camera in when you're analyzing something. Far more than I usually do. Thank you very much, little Billy. Always. I'll put it towards the trails in the sky block. Pokemon, Soul Silver, and the Kirby block. You got it. Now, I was talking about this too. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Spartan. Off and on. Mostly while watching the kids, actually. Because the littlest one has been getting fascinated with uh, with WoW, and so she likes to watch it. It's a good way to calm her down for a bit, to get a break, essentially. Um, so speaking of, it's, while I'm here, while I'm here. So this film, I was talking about this to Ross. This film, it was one of those examples where it went up and down, in my opinion, at the same time. Because on the one hand, they did so much right. Really. And then at the other level, uh, like, the, it, it's so funny. Like, this opening shot is brilliant, right? Just absolutely gorgeous. And there's the, the sexiest woman in the world, obviously. And uh, this opening battle, is just like in Star Trek uh, 7, is actually really, really tight. But then it just drifts into this nonsense instantly. <coughs> and you could just feel it, right? <coughs> you could just feel the directors and writers saying, just go with it, just go with it, just go with it. <laughs> we know it's stupid, just go with it. We understand. We understand, just go with it, just go with it. Just go with it, okay, okay, we're here. And it, it is cloud effect, it is absolutely cloud effect. Because then, you know, then we get to this sequence, it's dumb, there's some dumb stuff. And then we get to this, and then the movie starts to pick up again. Like the moment we get in the past, it's like, okay, I'm with it, I'm with it. Um, but there's two things I wanted to point out to you. Uh, first of all, this horror sequence right here is is actually very undervalued, I think. This whole thing where we where we don't really know what's going on, but we totally do, is totally the bomb under the chair, I'm just saying. This is great. Um, yeah, get the shields up! Um, why aren't the shields up? The, uh... Hang on, where's, where's, where's it? Sorry, give me a sec, give me a sec. There's a lot of great stuff in this film. I still very much enjoy First Contact, don't mistake me. Uh, okay, hang on. Let me scooch forward a little bit. So, here's mistake number one. Now, I've, I've said this for years. Everyone has said this for years. But what's really interesting about this is that she is so terrible because of continuity. Hear me out for a second. Something I've talked about a few times um, is that if you're going to do, do continuity, you have to do it well, right? You have to actually... I feel weird, like you can only see my hands down here. You, and you can see like Shadow Man and Snake Man here. You have to do it well. Con continuity by itself is not necessarily a good thing. In fact, if you just graft continuity onto something without any thought, it's actually usually a bad thing. There's a reason why external continuity is a negative category as well as a positive category, right? This is not the Borg Queen, because there is no such thing as the Borg Queen, because that's stupid. It negates everything about the Borg. The entire concept of the Borg being this modular species, which goes down to their cultural level and their individual level and their ship design and their planetary design. Everything about the Borg means there is no central hub. There's 50 hubs all working together. That's how the Borg operate. That's their whole shtick. Then you had a queen. Why? But the really weird thing is everything about the queen, her motivations. Yeah, exactly, Ross. Her motivations, her concept... Everything about the Queen, if she isn't a Borg, is really good. 
first of all, Alice Craig just knocks it completely out of the park. She's just, she's so good. Um, she's a great actress and she absolutely nails it. But her, she is so, uh, this is a slight spoiler. I apologize. So small spoilers to the film in three, two, one. She is so petty. Her actual motivation for everything she's doing, for for crushing an entire population, an entire species, <laughs> and fundamentally changing history for the entire galaxy, and everything, everything she does is because Picard said no to her. And that's great. I'm not making fun of that. That's great. That's a wonderful motivation. It's so... I don't know how to explain it. It's so relatable to see someone at such a severe and extreme level of power be motivated by something so extraordinarily pathetic, right? If she wasn't Borg, she would be a universal positive. Instead, she's the Borg queen. And so, and, and that's the dichotomy of First Contact in a nutshell. For everything they do right, they do something wrong. And it's like, God, man... Exactly, Dark Prince Riven. Exactly. Um, so I want to I want to share a little something here, really quick. This is the other thing. If you've seen my rumination of this, you know that one of the scenes I talk about most, which is the best scene in the entire film, is this scene right here. This is the best scene in the film, and I'm, I stand by that. Um, and it's a brilliant buildup. But what I what I didn't even talk about in the room was the buildup to this scene. Okay, so we're rewinding a bit. Rewinding, rewinding. So. Picard, his... God, Patrick Stewart is so good. Picard is doing this thing, right? He's still... He's captain, but he's not really freaked out or anything, right? He's affable, he's friendly, he's sharing the nature of the future with her. You know, the economics of the future are a little bit different, blah, blah, blah. And everything's cool. But then he goes and sees down this corridor. And the moment he does, his entire demeanor shifts down. And it's such a subtle shift that I don't think I've ever noticed before. How much he s gradually slides from, ha, ah, to, uh, and he just becomes this very, very detached. And look at him. He, you can actually see, this is a great shot. I, I got this completely by accident. You can see, here, I'll try to, I, I can't get my head that far down. He is physically recoiling right now. He is actually with, he's doing that thing where you pull your head back a little bit. You can see it in his neck. And he's just and there's and he's just performing this as he's going through here. And yet the whole time his expression is cold and calculating and he is unhesitating. And so we can see in his performance how much this is killing him and how much he's refusing to let it do anything to him. That's important. Because for all the crap, for all the fear and pain and hatred that he has of the Borg, he cannot bring himself to let it affect his job. He is too much of a professional. He is too much the captain. The captain. In order to... You're, you're kidding. My name is Legion. Uh, in order to let that affect him. But then, then we get to the best scene in the film. And then he loses it. That demeanor, that cold professionalism. Even when he's here, he does this little joke. Just Matinis and skirts. Sorry, that's nothing puzzle. But then he he finally, finally loses it. And the exact, it's so brilliant, the exact moment he loses it is when he recognizes who he's shooting. And I, I, I don't think I can get the freeze frame here because of how the fast forward works. And I, I don't trust hitting play to not get this banned. But the moment he actually recognizes the person he's seeing, he loses it. He can't do it. It finally bursts through the dam and he screams at the person he's shooting. Because one of his crew is someone that he is killing because of the Borg. God, that's so good. That's so good. Sorry, just... <laughs> this is why I like First Contact right here. Like, there's some decent action stuff in this film, but man. Did I find anything positive Nemesis? No. Uh, Nemesis... Oh, man. So, okay, first of all, speaking of going more in-depth and more in detail, we spent, I kid you not, about 30 minutes analyzing this village. 
because I, I we got to the point where they're like, ah, oh, you know, t you use a tool. What's the exact quote? You use a tool to do the work of a man. You take something away from the man, I believe is the quote. And then we rewound to this part of the film and just started looking at this village of no technology. Because look, just, I mean, just look at it. Just look at it. Look at how precise the, oh, I can't remember what it's called. The, the decor, there's a term for it. Yeah, the perfectly mowed lawn, the perfectly uh, kept bushes and, and the trees. And they've got these freaking, oh my God, these freaking, I can't remember what it's called. I've actually studied architecture and I can't remember the word. But if you look at the stuff on top of the roofs, right? Like that kind of, it does that thing where it like slides down and then there's like a little groove and then it goes down. There's a word for that. And those things are not easy to make, especially by hand. And as you can see, every roof in this village has something to that extent. See you around, Jesse. Have a good one, man. And the, I, I, look, look at it. Look at it. Look at this. They've got marble columns. Where are they getting all of the stone for this? Where are they getting the freaking lumber for all of this? <laughs> Everything. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The visual storytelling of most of Trek is pretty legit because the Trek, uh, like, set designers, what I would usually call the doodads in a video game, are usually really legit. They really know what they're doing. And they add a lot to most scenes. But this does the exact opposite. This, this just makes everything worse. And look, like, hey, here's, here's their farm. Yeah, that'll feed, I don't know, like, them for, I don't know, a week. Look at this place. I'm not even going to talk about the fact that they have an honest-to-God irrigation system, by the way, which, last I checked, probably qualifies as technology. You assholes. God. Just <sighs> now, as much as I came down on insurrection, because I can just tell. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you see? Do you see this bridge? Hang on, get the freeze frame right. Ah, it's so frustrating. There it is. Look at this bridge. Look how smooth that is. Look at the grooves in it. Look at this bridge. They just, they just. It's one unbroken piece of rock. How did they do that? All right. So before Ross kills me for bashing a film that I think he likes, if I remember correctly. You know what also struck me as I was going back through Insurrection? Everything to do with the Baku is garbage. Everything. All of it. But then, yes, this is during the Dominion War. Then we cut to this sequence. And all of a sudden, I I like this sequence. This This is cool. This is, this is interesting, and it's character, and it's talking about the world and the state of the things, and it's like, okay, this is interesting. This I'm, I'm kind of with this. This is weird. And there's this whole thing. They're, they're, they're doing some good exposition. They're trying to figure out what's going on, and okay, I'm with it. And then we get this dumb scene. We're just going to skip right through that because that's dumb. But then this happens. And, this, and the scenes between Troy and Riker are some of the best scenes in the entire film. Because they basically just let the two actors play off of each other, and, and they've always had really, really good chemistry with each other. So, it's really weird. Thank you, Jonathan Freeloader, very, very much. Always. And if you know what you want to put that towards, up to three things, please let me know. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm going to point out something that's cursed, okay? You ready for this? I'm about to give you cursed knowledge. You ready for this? I'm not joking. This might change how you view Star Trek forever. Okay? How many of you know what a boob plate is? So, for those of you who don't, it's a rubber thing you wear over yourself. And it goes here, and it forces your breasts into a very specific format, okay? Now, the thing here is, this is obvious in a lot of Trek. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. But yeah, Rick Berman pretty much insisted that every female member wear the boot plate. Look at Troy, look at Crusher. In this shot right here. 
it is so incredibly obvious. Because, no offense to either woman, that's not their boobs. That's not even a bra. That is a boob plate. And Rick Berman, this is not a joke, Rick Berman insisted that most of the female cast wear this boob plate. And there's a lot of reasons why that's stupid, juvenile, and sexist. But my favorite, my favorite thing is that it, it, it automatically in, assumes that there's only one format of female mammaries that is acceptable. Now, I know that sounds like a strange sentence, but you get what I mean. It was standardized. It was Rick Berman's whole shtick that he wanted the McDonald's of Trek. I've, I've talked about this before. He wanted all of Trek to be standardized and everything just follow the same format. And so that, that applied in a lot of different ways. And if I could really make my point here, give me a second. I'm going to pull up Star Trek 3. I know that's a weird direction to go, but just bear with me because we watched the TOS movies after the TNG movies. So this was kind of a thing for us. Okay, so hang on, let me pull this up here. Now, I, I know that it's going to be weird to hear a streamer say, look at all these women's boobs, but I'm about to say that, okay? Hang on, got to find the right scene. There it is. Now, look at all these women's boobs. If you're noticing something, hello Evo, you're noticing that they're different shapes and different sizes, you know, like women have. They were allowed to be their own body types that they are. Like, I, I know this sounds so strange and crude, but for real, look at that for a second. That is such a jarring contrast to the Rick Berman era of Trek, where every woman is allowed was was mandated to have those freaking boob plates on, and it's always the same one. It is always the exact same boob plate. So every woman just has the same boobs. You notice stuff like this when you're going really in depth, and that's that it's cursed knowledge. Like I said, I have cursed you now. Enjoy the curse. <laughs> Freaking Rick Berman. Anyways, you're welcome. I have finally cursed you all. Oh, no, they don't. My name is Legion. I mean, I'm ignoring the fact that they did actually use boob plates. Um. <coughs> like, that, that's that's not presumption, right? This just, in some cases, it's just more obvious than others. Um, oh, what was her stupid name? Although, hang on, you want more cursed knowledge? Do you want even more curse knowledge? <laughs> now, <laughs> no, it's not about the Ferengi. Although, good pick. Uh, what's a good episode to show this off? You know what? Let's pick up one of the worst episodes of TNG. Let's let's do that. I, I actually, I don't even have to go past this screen. I don't have to go past this screen right here. Because the boob plates were not limited to women. The men over here had to wear these muscle suits. Now, we've actually heard about this before. Several of the actors have talked about the muscle suits. But when you go back through season one, it's really, really obvious in a lot of shots, the muscle suits that they're wearing. Yeah, they, they look so uncomfortable. It looks so awkward. They, they eventually got rid of that. I, I, weirdly enough, they eventually got rid of the muscle suits. They kept the, the boob plates, but they got rid of the muscle suits. Um, you want to say something else cursed? I'm about to curse you with something. I, I, I almost guarantee you, like maybe only 2% of you have ever even seen this. You ready for this? You ready for this? Look back at the panels in the back, okay? Now look at the one directly above Picard. Do you see that black sheet of paper that's on the panel there? Look at the one directly to its left. It's much more obvious there that there's this rectangle. Like there's this rectangle of black paper there. You see it?
It was extremely common, mostly in Season 1. Remember, Season 1 was extremely low budget, like to the point where, frankly, I'm astonished they made a show at all. Um, yeah, it's it's there to block the, the lighting and the reflection of the camera. So they, ju they would just put uh, black paper up on the panels. Let's see if I can find another shot of this. Yeah, it's Code of Honor, by the course of Code of Honor. It's just freaking Code of Honor. I might not be able to... They don't have a lot of shots in the bridge in this episode, but they do have one more. Hang on, here we go, here we go. Uh, looks like there's no black paper up there right now. But the moment you see it, the moment you notice it, you will notice it forevermore. I have cursed you. Because in thr throughout all the season one... Okay, I'm not going to find another good shot of this. Um, Throughout all the season one... There's one right there. Right, it's it's not super visible, but right behind Tasha Yar's left uh, elbow, you can see one of the black papers. As soon as you know that it's there, you will see it forever. I curse you. <laughs> there it is. You can see it. It's 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 behind a little bit too. Uh, well, it's basically just straight behind uh, Tasha Yar there. They vary, Yura, and how obvious they are. I mean, obviously, this was a show that wasn't designed to be seen in 720p. But, like, ugh, there's this one thing. I'm trying to find a shot of it. I might have to actually hit play here. Hang on, I'm going to mute this. No, a little further. Oh, oh, hang on. Look at it. Look, look at the paper. Look at the paper. Oh, my God. Okay, okay. <clears throat> hang on. Let's see if he goes far enough forward for me to show it. He does not. Okay, of course he doesn't. Um... Yeah, let's skip skip a little bit more forward. There's a specific thing I want to show you. And of course, I'm not sure if it shows up in this episode at all. Ah, it looks like it's not going. We're not getting the right camera angle. Of course not. Look at look at the muscle suit, by the way. Look look at the muscle suit. Oh, look at the muscle suit. <laughs> But yeah, sometimes, like, there's one right there. You wouldn't notice that, right? The one just behind Worf. You wouldn't notice that if you weren't paying attention to it. But sometimes it's really, really obvious. Behold! <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm not going to find it in this episode, I don't think. It's an episode where they show that part of the room. Um, Where's... There's a dumb, dumb episode. Is this it? I think this is it. Yeah, right before this, maybe. Nope. Hang on, right after this, right after this. Still no? Come on, episode. I want to show them it's the most cursed thing. They get really clever with it sometimes. There's an episode. I don't remember the specific name of the episode. Let me let me show you something. Let me show you something. Um, so you see... Okay. You see that reflective thing immediately behind Troy on the far left of the screen? A trick that they will pull periodically, and this is actually clever, is they will replace that entire black reflection with the black paper. But they cut it right to the edge, so you wouldn't think about it until the camera pans over it. And obviously, what should happen is you should see the camera staring into the reflection. But you don't, because they black papered it. So, sometimes they're actually really clever with this concept. Actually, uh learned a lot about how to make a live action show studying this one go figure and yes that is actually lurch that is the same actor i think i'm gonna give up on this there's this stupid thing okay it's right next to uh where data usually sits on the bridge poor major barrett i'm just gonna say that really quick poor major barrett oh yeah hey look planet soundstage oh god planet soundstage oh god Yeah. Anyways, let's move on for Planet Soundstage for a second here. Oh, uh, we almost saw it. We almost saw it. Ah, not quite. What is she wearing? Um, it's not gonna pan over. It's not gonna do it. God damn it! So there's this thing. Okay, I know. Hear me out for a second. So if the camera were to pan like three degrees to the right, right? Okay. For those of you who know this show. Picture the layout of the bridge you had. There's Picard's ready room, right? And as he leaves, there's like this little outcropping right there. And it's 
the black um, paneling. It's the reflective black paneling that they use for everything, right? And that is the reason why it's not showing up in so many of these shots was because the camera crew and the, and the cinematic director hated it because it was so reflective that they couldn't get like any shots of it without the, the, the light beaming off of it or the camera being and the crew being visible. Because remember, all these cast are staring at the crew, right? Like there's there's a giant open space over here or sorry, over here. Um, so they hated it. And so it's the most overt examples of uh, of the black paper I've ever seen because they had to just sometimes just cover half the thing and be like, here, just, just, here. <laughs> I'm trying to think, where's an episode where Picard comes out of his ready room in season one? Is there such a thing? Ah, oh, I can't think of it. I can't think of a specific example. I have failed you. All right, we'll try it. We'll try conspiracy. We'll try conspiracy. It's that thing. It's the thing right behind Data. It's right there. You notice how the camera is going all way out of its way to make sure that that thing is not facing anything. Because that thing was just a plague. Scooch, 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 scooch. There's a conspiracy. Oh my god. Yeah, there. okay, there's the damn thing. Of course, now there's no freaking black paper on it. Oh, actually, there is. My bad. But only a little. That was easily. That was that was good. That was good. That's not a big thing. Find it sound stage. Gotta find it sound stage. Very important. Very important. <laughs> well, I just want one more. Just one more. Give me one more shot of your terrible, terrible stuff. Oh yeah, by the way, really fun thing. So check this out. Uh, Gene Ronberry insisted on the muscle suit. Um, the person who cared, who hated the muscle suit most? Can anyone guess? Can anyone guess the person who was the most pissed off by the muscle suit? That's right, it was Wesley Crusher. Um, this is actually not a very... Yeah, it was weed. That's not a great shot of it, but... One of the reasons so many of his outfits look so baggy is specifically because of the fact that he had that damn muscle suit on. If I could get a shot down on the planet. Uh, of course I can't. Ah, whatever. That's not a really good showcasing of it, but he's got the suit on too. Because of course he does. Even the kids are buff. But what's really funny to me is Gene Ronberry is just a disgusting pile of human trash, right? Like, he's, he's the worst. But the Boot plates didn't show up until Berman's era of Trek. So make of that what you will. I was actually probably stop talking about all this crap. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. The butt plates. Well, no, I'm kidding. To my knowledge, there were none. Although actors do uh, do that. That's a real thing. Um, so for those of you not aware, sometimes, especially actresses, <coughs> will get a stunt double who, no, it's not a butt plate. What it is, is it's another woman standing there instead of them. That's, that's a thing. Anyway, see you around. My name is Legion for Weird Money. You know, I'm I'm dying, dude. I don't know what you want from me. This is very unprompted. A butt double. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a butt double. Oh, that's tiny. Uh, there's your boob plate, by the way. It just... It's as obvious as it gets. She is such a good actress, too. I've said this before. Jerry Ryan is a really good actress, and she does a very good job of playing Seven of Nine. And she is my favorite character on that show for a reason. But just look at that. By the way, actually, this is a perfect shot right here. Because you can also see the other thing most female Trek actors, actresses were forced to wear. And that's the corset. You can actually see 
the grooves in the corset under her suit there. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's not that's not how that works. That's not how any of that works. Just yeah. I believe Kate Mulgrew had to wear a corset uh, up until the point at which she insisted that they allow her to change her hair. Also known as when Rick Berman kind of walked away from the show. Uh, if you remember that. When Now, Brenna Braga, that's, that's actually a long and complicated thing. But the long and the short of it is that when, Br when Berman left the show, Braga basically took over and Berman went off to do his own thing and uh, get the Enterprise started. Excuse me. And... Um, Things got better, but not, frankly, and I'm going to say this as nice as I can, not better enough, because this was the dark era of Braga, an era he has publicly apologized about many times for very obvious reasons. Braga would eventually get even better and finally recover, but I, I did a little looking up in something. Check this out. Uh, whoa. Stars. Starfield. Uh, I forget the exact amount of time. Let's just go up here. But Braga was so burnt out after everything that happened from TNG to Voyager to Enterprise that he took a six-year sabbatical from everything. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to take a six-year break. But I want you to picture what has to happen for you to take a six-year sabbatical. No, Braga didn't do anything for DS9. Or if he did, it's it's something not really worth mentioning. He played Starfield for six years. He developed Starfield for six years. Sorry. Anyways, I wonder if Mr. Red is still there. He probably left at this point. Bailed. I don't blame him. Um, okay. DS9 really isn't a vacuum. Uh, we're going to have to really talk about DS9 when it comes to the rewrite, because Ira Stephen Bear, who I have a lot of venom for, wanted so hard to, to do that typical writer thing. I don't know what it's called. It's the contrarian writer thing, right? Every writer's talked about this. Writers have talked about this for, for decades. Um... It's uh, it's the concept where like like you want to write something uh, for a particular thing, and you just you just want to go as, as far against it as well. Yeah, yeah, you want to break the setting, you want to break the rules. You're told you can't go past warp ten. We're gonna go past warp ten. You're told you can't have the Klingons do this. You have the Klingons do this. Like it's it's a very 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 common thing. It goes back decades. Uh, Iris Stephen Bear was very much trying and has been very op open about this. Was trying really hard to be anti TNG, and he was just in love with the idea. <laughs> that um you know the federation was secretly evil and blah 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 blah. And so there's some stuff in DS9 that probably will have to be reined in a bit when it comes to that. But as we were talking about not so long ago, not everything, because he was already reined in enough that most of it kind of fits in inside the Star Trek box. Uh, like um uh Layton, Admiral Layton. He's fine, right? No issues. I think you're right, Dark Road. I think that is deconstructionist writing or whatever. I mean, KOTOR 2, right? A game pretty much written to be a deconstruction of Star Wars. For good and for bad. And yeah, like like with all things, there's doing it well and there's there's not doing it well. Excuse me. I love it, by the way. I, I hop on a stream just to give everyone an update. And uh, and I, I get someone com complaining about my review or about my stream. That's just that's just great. Uh, whatever. Where are we going? Um, just, what need is the update. Uh, so I'm finishing the last of the paperwork right now. Like, literally right now. And um, once this is done, I will actually be officially done with everything. 
uh, brother-in-law left for a week, that destroyed my schedule for a week, and then I was sick, and I'm still currently sick, um, so I haven't actually started my break yet. That's, that's the summary, that's the super duper ultra summary. Now let's see how well Starfield scored, shall we? I'm going to actually take a break. I promised multiple people. I promised I would not come back to regular streaming uh, as soon as I finished the paperwork. I, I thought about it. I'm not going to lie. I thought about just starting stream tomorrow, but no. Hang on, Mr. Let me Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. Evo, no, I must bow. Bowing super duper low. Because I started bowing before he said no bow. So it counts. Now bow. Lord to tyranny. Not find the wrath of the righteous. Um. Sorry, you asked me a question about the Lorani. What was that question? Do you remember? I think it was Ross who asked that. Uh, yes, it is Spartan. Kata is a huge expansion. Just gargantuan. I don't think we've ever had an expansion that big. Not even Legion. Uh, then again, Legion did have the artifacts and the order halls. Okay. Starfield. Ah! Thank you, Fife. Speaking of WoW. Favorite episode overall. Um, I'm not sure here. Let me let me ask them really quick because I think they're gone right now. Uh, no, not at all. You're a Kata took forever. There's a huge gap in content between Wrath and Kata. I don't know if they're on it. I'll poke them. Um, Warlords was an even bigger gap. The, the gap in content between Pandaria and Warlords was crazy. They lost a lot of players at that point. So that's going towards FF7R1. Uh, wow, War Within and the Mario Kart block. Okay, Starfield. Oh, actually, that is on the books, Ross. That is a thing that will happen. Starfield, Starfield, Starfield. Did I actually get some sleep? No, but thank you for asking. Okay. So that's... Can someone write these numbers down, please? 31. 76. 25. And 114. Good God. Okay. Someone, so, uh, ooh, I'm going to laugh if this happens. I really am. I don't think so, but you never know. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Secret of the Stars is negative 353.72. Hang on, I'm not done with all the math yet. <laughs> Hang on. So to repeat that, Secret of the Stars is negative 353.72. I went to the points for a reason. So 
star field is negative 353.18. No, no, Secret of the Stars is still worse by point. Oh, geez. Uh, hang on. So, what, what is that? by 0.54. Secret of the Stars is still the worst game by 0.54. I, I, it's just a basic screw up on my part, Spartan. That's all. So hang on, let's update the actual review chip page. Let's see how close that gets to everything else. Let's, let's see how that lines up. It is. It's a proper sequel to the Secret of the Stars. I, I cannot argue that. Whoops. God damn it. My game. Secret of the Starfield. Guess that's. Jeez, uh, what is that? I mean, if Tom Cruise is in Starfield, would you be surprised by that? Would you? So, in answer to you, uh, who was that? It was Ross, wasn't it? Uh, the answer they have given is still parallels. I mentioned that earlier. I doubt that's actually their favorite episode overall, but that is. Let the click sticks the most. So yeah, so we've got yeah, Secret Stars. And then just just barely after is Starfield. And then Devil May Cry 2, Quest 64, Mega Man X7, Kingsfield 4. Age of Sigmar, Realms of Ruin is number seven or whatever it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. Drakengard went down a little. Shattered Universe, uh, I think, surpassed Wolfenstein. Breath of Fire 2 is down there. Breath of Fire 1 is down there. Just Cause 4 jumped down pretty far because it's an older thing. We need... we If we if we squeezed out one more negative... Uh, Lufia 1 is negative 60.85. I think that one went up. Yeah, that one went up, actually. It went from like 68 to 60 or something like that. Can I imagine myself playing Starfield again someday? If there is a DLC for Starfield, then we might see Starfield surpass Secret of the Stars. And I, I realize I just automatically assumed the DLC would be garbage. Actually, oh my god, I just realized something. So, for those of you who know, uh, we uh, we actually give automatic negatives for microtransactions. Because screw microtransactions, right? Now, how many negatives we give depends on how bad they are and how obtrusive they are and how much they affect the game design. But if you have microtransactions at all, it's at least one negative. So if they add microtransactions to Starfield, there's our negative. God. Well, if the DLC is a net positive, it would it would drive the score up. It would. Paid mods would do it. it depends on how they implement it to be honest, because that's that's actually a more gray area than it sounds. Um, if you remember, there have been paid mods that have been implemented, let's call it tolerably, 
And then there have been paid mods that have not been implemented tolerably. So it would depend in that case. So it's not automatic. Uh, if horse armor came out today, that would qualify as a microtransaction. 100%. It kind of was back in the day. It just got baked into things. Hi, is Miristar. Uh, I'm not actually sure, Blade Traval. I'm not, I'm not 100%. It would, it would depend. I don't think they are either. Did you, did anyone see that news post? Oh my God. They're working on Elder Scrolls 6. And I'm sorry. Starfield came out six months ago. Seven months ago now. Excuse me. So, if they're, if Elder Scrolls 6 is playable now, either you've been working on Elder Scrolls 6 well before Starfield came out and you just abandoned Starfield, which is very possible, or you are so copy-pasting Skyrim, because that's called what it is, in the design of Elder Scrolls Six that it is functionally playable for the same reason that, like, if I was just to, to drop some assets into Skyrim's engine, it would be playable, right? Hi, Russ. I, I actually do think it's possible, Blade Travol. I, if, here's the thing, this is going to sound strange. If you are correct, then I have lost any remaining respect I ever had for most of the Bethesda central development team, management staff, and marketing team. And I want to explain why really briefly. Because the thing we have been told over and over, even after Starfield came out, was that Starfield was a passion project. We have receipts that indicate that they have design documents, no pun intended, uh, going back to like 2002 for how much they've wanted to make Starfield and how much this has been a big thing of them. If they were willing to straight up abandon Starfield and just start working on Elder Scrolls 6, then they are lying to us. I don't appreciate being lied to. Yeah, no, exactly, as Marister, I agree. It's one of the most soulless games I've ever played. That's why it's the second worst game I've ever reviewed. Well, yeah, no, like, like, Larian leaving Baldur's Gate 3 makes perfect sense. I called that when I was reviewing it, months ago, if you'll remember. I even actually gave the game a negative, because one of the biggest things that I thought was a flaw in Baldur's Gate 3 uh, was it was a kitchen sink problem, right? They were so clearly throwing everything into this one game because this was their one game. And once that's done, they're going to move on and do their other thing. I, that was very obvious just from looking at the game. Um, and yeah, I, I wouldn't want to deal with Hasbro. I wouldn't want to deal with Wizards. Screw both of those companies. Oh God, you're right, Spartan. Uh, agreed. Call room. Screw them. Like, Baldur's Gate 3, good game. I have issues with it. Not gonna lie. But a solid game. I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to doing a co-op playthrough of it someday. But, nah, yeah. Move on. Do your own thing. Get away from that crap. I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm blown away that Starfield matched the number two slot. I really am. I was too. 353. God, that's terrible. Right. Sorry, you asked that earlier, as to me, and I apologize. Um, do I think... Which Metroid game do I think will score the worst? There are really only three contenders for that. Metroid 1, Metroid 2, and Other M. I am going to go and give my prediction right now that I think Other M will score the worst. Uh, I will admit, please don't yell at me too much, that I've been refreshing myself on the backstory. Backstory? The behind the scenes and the makings of, of Metroid Other M. And I have been, as I've been going through it, I've been reminding myself of what a goddamn mess that game is. Um, I think the gameplay might help with the overall score of Other M, but you also have to understand that uh, everything about, for example, say the missile system and the flow of Other M and a lot of the enemy design and just 
Eh. I, I think other M might actually take the bottom slot. It's why we're doing it first. How are we playing other M? Oh, well, there's this thing called emulation, which I would never do. Oh, yeah, other M is going to tank on the story axis. Just completely tank. Just, God, I just... I know that reality doesn't work this way, but it feels weird that a game that's made by the same general team and designers uh, could be so much worse that's made so much later, right? Like, how does Super Metroid have such better story, specifically story, than Other M? How, how is that a thing? I mean, obviously Prime has a better story, but, you know, Prime is Prime. By the way, speaking of zooming in the camera, I think Super's going to score better than most of us expected to. There's some issues with Super. I'm not trying, trying to say there aren't. But I think Super is going to just kind of crack the review system in half. I don't think it's going to get the absolute top. But like... Yeah. Super is Super's going to score very, very, very well. Um, so which Metroid 2 version do I think will score best? That's a good question. Oh yeah, the density of Super is going to be bonkers. Just absolutely bonkers. Super is one of those really, really rare circumstances where I could pause on, say, about 50% of the game. Like if I, it, 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 I'm saying this wrong. On about 50% of the single screens in the game, I could just freeze the screen and talk about the good game design on that screen, on that one screen. That is how dense Super Metroid is. It is crazy how good the level design is in that game. There's a reason it is considered the uh, originator of the of the Metroidvania concept, even though it actually predates Super. Anyways, um, best of best of the twos. See, I actually rather liked the the three DS too. And I, th I certainly think the Game Boy 1 is probably going to be the worst of the twos. But I'm really not sure. See, I actually didn't play all the way through uh, AM2R. So I can't really speak to that. But what I did play of AM2R was really tight. So I I'd say that's going to be a close race between AM2R and Samus Returns. Oh, yeah, I haven't talked about Zero Mission or Fusion. Um, so, Zero Mission's probably going to be pretty solid. All right. Proper remake and all that. Fusion. Fusion was the warning sign of Other M. We didn't know it at the time, but it was. If you remember, Fusion is probably one of the least Metroid Metroids out there. And I think, and, and obviously, it's a, it's direct narrative connection to uh, Other M, so that's, that's fun. But I think that it's probably going to do very, very well in a few specific aspects, especially on the narrative aspect. And I'm not sure how it's going to do on the gameplay because it's not... Yeah, it's, it's very anti-Super. That's a good way to put that. It's very much not a Metroidvania, to, to be as honest about that as I can. Now, that's fine. It doesn't have to be a Metroidvania, weird as that may sound. Um, but I do think that it's going to be its own thing. Like, like, to use a contrast here, Fusion was trying to be not super. Dread was trying to be super, right? Like, Metroid Dread is, a, is pretty much a straight uh, development of super, whereas Fusion was trying to be something else entirely. We'll see. We'll see. Fusion, uh, Fusion didn't really... So, Fusion ended on a bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, the big reveal that, spoilers the Federation are not universally good. Shrug. But it didn't really set up for anything so much as just kind of being like, hey, the Federation aren't really good. Um, whether that's set up for anything or not is kind of debatable. We do know that, I can't remember his name, Sakimoto, I want to say, uh, the, the main Metroid guy, really, really wanted to continue that plot thread, but felt he couldn't do a good enough story on the GameCube. 
Metroid Prime says hi. So he waited, and he took some time, and then and then Other M was actually the game that he put together as a direct result result of that desire. That's why Other M and Fusion are so directly connected to each other. Um, where that goes after that, eh, it's a little more debatable. But we, we he'll have noticed, I'm sure, that Samus Returns and Dread are also directly connected. So, hey, Midnight Fox, I have not streamed FF7 R2. I do not own a PlayStation Five. I also don't just stream games randomly. I stream games as they are funded by you, the viewers. Um, so when it is eventually funded and also comes out on PC is when that will be played. I mean, honestly, yeah. Ditto as to mean. I'm really looking forward to Prime 4. I mean, name a bad game that Retro's made. Trick question. There is no such thing. Granted, they haven't made a very large amount of our games. Anyways, I'm slowly losing my ability to talk. This is mostly intended to be like a five-minute thing, uh, updating people that, you know, I'm, I'm alive and I'm going to finally actually take my freaking break. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take my break, I think. So, uh, I uh, end statement. I feel, t God, I feel terrible, Disco. Uh... So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually start taking my break. Woo! -hoo. Paperwork's done. Paperwork's done. Kids are cool. Hopefully I'll be better tomorrow. So let's see you guys.